Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG podcast with John and Hannah. And as per the result of our Twitter poll for this week's Friend or Foe Friday, we're going to be talking about the Mongrel Man. So, as I said before the intro, today we're looking at the Mongrel Man, which first appears in the official Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition of Monster Manual 2 by Gary Gygax. And if we look at it here, we can see it's a rare creature, although they tend to cluster around in large groups. They have low to average intelligence, they have one to four hit dice, and they have normally one attack but the damage can vary they're described as not being a race unto themselves but they're a mixture of many different creatures so you could have the mix of the mix of human orc gnoll ogre dwarf etc all of those bloodlines mixed together because of this mixture they're seldom welcome in lawful or good society and they normally look sort of mutated and mismatched and sort of patchwork as a result of that all mongrel men have the abilities of camouflage and mimicry they can hide themselves and their items with great skill normally a turn's required to do this but the chance of remaining unnoticed is 80 percent plus one percent for each turn spent preparing when camouflaging buildings and structures the time requires varies obviously depending on what you're camouflaging to assist them in obtaining the items they want because they can't just trade for them normally they've got mad pickpocket skills each with a 70 percent chance of it success for every 10 mongrel men there'll be at least one with two hit dice for every 30 there'll be one with three hit dice and for every 40 there'll be one with four hit dice and in the lair is a leader with five hit dice and five four hit dice bodyguards they normally fight with clubs and swords but a small number five percent of the group will be armed with blowguns and poison and paralyzing darts they normally live in areas of large mixed population layering in ruins deserted buildings or other places they're generally not going to be bothered by people they speak fragmented common and their appearance can vary greatly and in the book we've got a bit of black and white artwork that shows this hunched sort of hooded figure wearing a sort of patchwork jerkin with a hood on it it has one hoofed foot one sort of null foot a human right hand a sort of crab claw left hand and a face which is part reptilian but sort of diagonally divided with a sort of furry almost wolf-like looking face so nice bit of artwork again that slightly cartoony style of first ed D, black and white but quite interesting so, love, I can see you've got the monster manual there for AD and D Second Edition. So, is there any difference with the Mongrel Man in this edition? Well, the artwork is very similar. We've got this guy with like one uh, paw, one hoof, one hand, one claw, half reptile face, half beast face. Yeah. Although, obviously, the art's colour in the the monster manual. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely a lot more striking, especially with this mishmash of parts. Although I see they've done away with the crab claw arm, which is a shame. I quite like them. Again, we've got this description of them being like a mixture of many species. Yeah. Um, talking about them having skills in mimicry, pickpocketing, camouflage. Normally fight with clubs, but 5% of the members of the group encountered are armed with blowguns and poison or paralysing darts. Yep, so same as the um, Monster Manual 2 for first day. Mm-hmm. And then a um, bit in their like, society. Yeah. Talks about how they pride themselves on the ability to survive, and they consider the title The Survivor to be much more esteemed than The Great. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I suppose, to be honest, if you look like that and you're hated by all these races because they can see a mixture of their foes in you, then, yeah, just being able to survive day to day would be quite an achievement. It talks about how they have different types of society based on whether they're like enslaved mongrel men or free mongrel men. Yeah. Um, that the free ones are uh, not violent except for self-defence they raise game, grow fruit and veg, have a long tradition of art, music and literature, whereas the enslaved ones are uh, quite happy to kill on the orders of their master. Um, But both types prefer not to have contact with other creatures. Okay. 
So after the AD and D Monster Manual, yeah. they appear in third edition in the Fiend Folio. That's not the Fiend Folio from first edition. That's the third edition book, which doesn't really share any sort of like common lineage. It's just the name they use. But I can see they've relabeled them as Mongrel Folk in this, and they look a bit more sort of goblinoid from the. Uh, yeah, see, they seem to have like lost the distinctive sort of Frankenstein-y look. Yeah. They've not like got different distinct elements of different creatures. It's just a pink goblin. I can see it says there in the first paragraph that they're descended from generations of like crossbreeding amongst the mm-hmm. worst examples of many species. So they've still sort of kept that idea they're a mixture of different bloodlines. But like I say, the artwork's just some dingy brown sort of ugly looking goblinoid with a shield and what looks to be a club. Mm-hmm. So does it say anything else? Is there anything else interesting about them? Uh, speak common and their own pigeon language. Okay. Um, excellent mimics. Bonuses on camouflage. Again, third ed, that's represented more in skills than powers. Yeah, I presume they've got, like, disguise skill and sort of stealth and stuff yeah, like that. Uh, although they have also got the emulate race power. Oh, what does that let them do? Um... Basically, it means they can use magic items that only work for, for example, elves. Right. They've got some elf blood, they can use it. Oh, that's they can cool. also use the dwarf item and the orc item. Um, now, is that only if that particular mongrel man's got, like, that sort of bloodline in him, or is it just they can emulate any race? Does it say? It says automatically emulate emulate any humanoid race with no need for a skill check oh so even if you've not got dwarf blood you could still like use that skill to be like oh i'm going to use this dwarf Mm -hmm. only like magical hammer or whatever that's a pretty useful feature especially if you've got a large group of them you know if you can get your hands on some magic items chances are whatever it is you're probably Mm going to be able to use it um and then we've got the obligatory third edition note about them as player characters Favourite class is Rogue. Makes sense, you know, with the disguise and pickpocketing and stuff. Spellcasters are uh, adepts, um, very occasionally clerics. Yeah, and I believe adepts are like the sort of NPC, like lower powered class version of like a sort of shaman or something like that, if I remember correctly. And there's a very long, complicated way of saying that being a mongrel man doesn't affect your character level. <laughs> Okay, so the next appearance we have from them is in 5th edition, and they appeared in the adventure The Curse of Strahd. And they've undergone a little bit of a change in here, possibly to move away from the whole idea of like interbreeding and mixed bloodlines. In Curse of Strahd, they're described as humanoids that have undergone, or whose ancestors have undergone, horrific magical transformations to the extent they retain only a fraction of their original being. Now, this could be to move away from the bloodline mixing, as we've said, or it could just be because that's more in favour with um, Ravenloft, which is where Curse of Strahd is set, because there did used to be a sort of race that was roughly analogous to half-orcs, like called Calibans, I think they were, in old Ravenloft, which were people who were cursed, basically. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of like twisted and mutated when they came out, and these mongrel folk seem to have sort of taken the place of that. They still have the sound mimicry. It describes them as having misshapen mouths and vocal cords. They can imitate sounds made by beasts and humanoids that they've heard. They're not sophisticated to you enough to use these sounds as a convert form of communication, but they can lure enemies into a trap and like distract them and stuff like that. They're described as being outcasts. They're not welcome into the civilized society in inverted commas. However, they are camouflage experts, being able to hide themselves away. Basically... Until it's seen, a camouflage mongrel man gets advantage on stealth checks made to hide. And we're told in this version, because they're magically created, that it's possible to restore a mongrel folk to its original form using greater restoration. However, this only works if this is a mongrel folk that's been transformed by magic, because when they breed, their offspring tend to also be twisted, and obviously they can't have a reverse because they were born like that. However, we're also told that about one child in every hundred from a mongrel folk coupling looks like its non-mongrel folk parent which is interesting 
the stat block gives us a, a little random table that you can roll on for each mongrel folk to determine what sort of random mutation they have. And these are amphibious, dark vision, flight, keen hearing and smell, spider climb, standing leap or two-headed. They have a bite attack and a weapon attack or a claw attack and they're described in this as normally being armed with a dagger. They can make two attacks per round, one with a bite and one with the claw or dagger. But aside from the sort of few small background tweaks, they are pretty similar to the earlier versions. Mm -hmm. Now, also as well, this creature features in Old School Essentials by Necrotic Gnome, although they're renamed Mutoids in that. And they're pretty much the same thing, you know, humans with mismatched body parts of many different creatures. And the artwork is obviously a sort of callback Mm. to the first edition Monster Manual 2. They can take people by surprise on a roll of one to three on a D6, as long as they have one turn of preparation because they're masters at camouflage. They can mimic the sound of any monster or animal. They can pick pockets with a 70 ba- 70% base chance of success. And groups of 10 plus are led by an individual with two hit points. And if there's a group of 40 plus, they'll be a chieftain with four hit dice. And we get a little bit about their origin where it just says they're rumoured to have been created by magic, possibly an accident. They have one hit dice, they attack with a weapon, and that's pretty much them. However, Gavin Norman from Necrotic Gnome, as part of the, the sort of Kickstarter for the advanced fantasy books for old school essentials, he made an issue zero of his carcass crawler zine that he's going to be releasing soon available on pdf i was lucky enough to get a copy of that because i backed the the kickstarter for old school essentials and in that there is a race class because old school essentials is based on bx dnd which allows you to play a mutoid and basically you get a few of the sort of like rogue abilities so you get uh, the hiding shadows the you get a sort of a mimicry ability a move silently ability and a pickpocket ability and you get a sort of percentile chance of those that goes up as you go up in level you also get one mutation on a d8 table which can be beast ears beast eyes clawed hands gills pincer scales spring legs or sticky tongue and that looks like a fairly interesting class to play you know if you wanted to be a sort of a bit of a rogue but you wanted to have a sort of like a bit of a different sort of spin on it so Mm -hmm. that's quite interesting they can use leather armor and shields they can use one-handed weapons and all missile weapons their alignment can be pretty much whatever you want and they speak common so i think that's pretty much it in terms of stats so what do we think about potentially using mongrel folk in games I, I kind of think there's a big fat elephant in the room and we kind of need to talk about it before we go on. Go, go on then. So, obviously, the earlier iterations of this have got some very racist undertones about, like, mixing bloodlines and creating monsters. And that's really not a cool idea to be pushing in your game. So, if you want to use them... Maybe come up with some like other origin for them. Well, I think well that's what they've tried to do in later editions, and certainly even in old school essentials, it suggests that they're a result of yeah. like magical meldings rather than just like crossbreeding. <laughs> but um, just, I, just sort of had to point that out. As you've said, I mean, personally, I, I don't have a problem with if you want to use the the original version in your game it's down to whatever works for your group. I mean, you know your groups better than we do, but uh, I think certainly. In the modern times, we're aware that sort of like interbreeding it, it like that doesn't, doesn't work. Anymore. Like, yeah, it doesn't really work like that. But there's certainly no shortage of like magic and reasons you can come up with for yeah, the, this for idea of it. like taking several creatures and mashing them together. Yeah, is something that's been around for like ever. Indeed, you know, yeah. various different chimeric type things this is basically just a humanoid chimera that's asymmetrical well i mean look at look at saruman breeding like the orakai in lord of the rings 
But um, I, I can actually talk about using these in games because I've actually used these in my old school Essentials game using the Mutoid version that we've just discussed. Mm -hmm. And in my old school Essential game, which is set in a sort of semi Arctic environment, they were the remains of one of these ice walker tribes, like human nomads who lived on the ice flows. And they were basically betrayed into the hands of an evil warlock called Takrat, who sort of bound them to his service in an attempt to improve them to make them stronger since the, the sort of ice walkers are pretty much like the, the sort of halflings of my setting he basically enchanted them and tried to make them stronger and better but because obviously these magics never tend to work as you'd envisioned them it did make them stronger and sort of better in terms of raw combat troops and did bind them to his will but it also twisted them sort of monstrously and made them into these mutoids uh in my game, they had like they effectively had like a mark on them that sort of bound them to Takrit's will. However, when the player characters killed Takrit, that mark sort of disappeared, and they all regained their intelligence, if not their appearance, because that couldn't be undone. And then they were just like any other sort of normal folk that could be dealt with, and the players were able to sort of form a peace between them and these frost dwarves who they were fighting against because it was only due to Takrit wanted to take the dwarf stuff that he was like forcing his troops to like fight against them using his magical control over them. So that was how I sort of did it, using magic to express why the transformation mm -hmm. had occurred, but also giving the players chance to see that underneath that magical control, they actually had their own minds and they were just as intelligent as anyone else. And when they broke that control, there were then people they could deal with and now they freed them, this mutoid race class has now become available in my game. So if they wanted to, when they need to gen a new character, they could actually play part of this tribe that they freed. And I thought that was a nice way to get them into the game without, like you say, the sort of stereotypical, like, oh, a load of different races got jiggy with it and mm -hmm. made a mongrel man. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's the sort of many different creatures element that makes them unique they've not yeah. they're not like the creatures in dagon that have all got elements dagon. Of, they've all got elements of fishmen to them yeah the sort of half transformed deep ones yeah you, these are a they, big mix up of whatever and th yeah i mean i've got to admit they before you even said that they do remind me of the sort of the deep one hybrids from like Lovecraft mm -hmm. because you've got these humans who are sort of partly transformed into deep ones but not really so they've still got enough of their humanity and it's that uncanny valley thing isn't it you know where you see yeah. something that looks 80 to 90 percent human mm -hmm. but it's just a little bit off and your brain sort of registers that as more scary than something that's completely non-human it's something that we sort of looked at quite a bit when I was doing scare acting yeah and like one of the best ways to make your face look like a zombie face is to sort of half close one of your eyes and sort of move your mouth differently on one side to the other and twist your body so that you're putting all your weight on one leg and maybe one arm hanging limp and because it's all asymmetrical it creates that creepy effect Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and obviously we've, we've got the fact that these <clears throat> these mutoids, these mongrel folk, they are sort of this asymmetrical mishmash of mm -hmm. different parts, crab claws, wolf heads, stuff like that. So I think the advantage that has in just in terms of raw, like using them in games, is that they can pretty much be what you need them to be to fill a particular niche. So you need a you need a mongrel man to like pursue the party. It's easy enough to go, oh, he's got wolf legs, he can run really fast. You need one who's like a bit of a bruiser to go into combat. Oh, he's got like an armoured carapace and he's got the big claws. So, Because obviously as a GM, when you're using them as monsters, you're not really restricted to just the mutations on these little random tables. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a mongrel man who's like got two claws or maybe he's got like an extra long neck or something like that, you can easily do that. So there, in terms of when you're running a combat, We've talked before, it's 
often quite difficult to sort of come up with ways to keep combats fresh and make them interesting. One of the great things about Mongrel Folk is you can always throw a few in with sort of like different bizarre mutations that give them odd effects or like additional damage or they can move really quickly or they can attack from range with a long neck or whatever just to like twist up the combat a bit and like make it a bit more interesting. So I think they're really good for that. But they'd also be interesting to look at as a sympathetic NPC group. Yeah. Because obviously they've got all this stuff about them being a marginalised group already, yeah. about them being pushed to the edges of society, being forced to steal whatever. Yeah, and I mean, that, that's one of the ways I tried to use them in my game, because before they'd killed the warlock, they had one of these mutants that were fighting in combat, and the, this magical mark on them, one of the player characters sort of described his um, cut as he attacked it. He actually like, cut through the mark and like broke the connection, and this mutant was suddenly free of this control, and as he sort of collapsed on this guy, pretending that he was really injured, he was like, oh, quick, get me away from here, like, help me out. And they were like, all right, I don't know what's going on, but like, he seems to be like not hostile anymore. <laughs> all right, let's take him away. And this NPC explained, they found out about the fact, oh, these, these, are, these aren't bad people, these aren't monsters, they're just being compelled. They're effectively victims mm-hmm. of this horrendous warlock. And, you know... Once they're freed of his control, that they're, they're quite helpful. They've got the same wants, drives, and desires as any other people. And this M- this NPC unfortunately got killed later on in like a fight. But the player characters were getting quite fond of him because they not only was he a helpful NPC who'd help him in a fight, because he was grateful to them for freeing him, but also they were invested in him because they'd helped free him from this thing. And it led them into thinking, oh, maybe we can free the others, you know. And that's one of the things that led them to killing the warlock. And then go, instead of going like, oh, yeah, but we've still got all these mutants, we're going to have to get out the swords and like mop them up, they were like, all right, well, the control's probably broken now. Is there a way we can deal with this without just killing them all? So that led to what, the friar of our group, prayed by um, Arfed, starting uh, to like organise like a peace treaty between them and getting them all to sit down at the table and, like, because of his roles, he didn't manage to like get them to become like bosom buddies or anything like that. But they at least agreed, like, look, we're both on this island. Now the warlock's gone. We don't really have any beef with each other. Let's just say you guys will stay over there. We'll stay over here. We'll not mess with each other. And then, who knows, maybe in a few years' time, once we've tested that out, if it works, maybe there can be a closer alliance and maybe even a friendship. And I really like that because it was a lot more satisfying for me. They got a bit of combat fighting the warlocks and the troops when they were being controlled. They got to help some NPCs, the Frost mm-hmm. Dwarfs fight against them. But it didn't end with like a huge combat. It ended with the aftermath of the combat with them going, let's sit down around the table and like try and work out how we can make peace between these two groups. And I really like that because it's not something that happens in a lot of sessions. So, yes, yeah, so I think what I think what we're trying to say is... Um, Obviously, if you want to use them as straight combat fodder, you can do. They're quite interesting, and they're good for that. However, if you do want to delve a little bit more into their background and try and sort of show these sort of like these outcasts potentially created by magic, you can certainly do that, and there's a lot more you can get out of this race than a simple combat fodder. Mm. But it all depends on how much of a part of your game you really want to make them and how much effort you want to put into expanding their origins because the books don't really give you a lot they're basically like a wizard did it and you pretty much have to make up the rest yourself but that's not a bad thing because if you're willing to do that potentially you can drop them into an awful lot of places in your campaign you want some shock troops made by the evil wizards instead of using orcs how about you use a mongrel man that he's created maybe this villainous um, wizard is capturing like the locals and he's transforming them that's a good way to get PCs to insta hate your villain he's taking innocent people, he's making them into these mongrel folk, and then even if you kill the wizard, they're probably not going to go back to normal, what do you do with these mongrel folk, they're not going to be accepted by most civilised places as it says in all the books so do the players help them make their own community what do they do I mean that could be interesting but Is that somewhere you want to go with your game? Entirely down to you and your group. They could be quite interesting as player characters as well. Yeah. If if you're enough of a masochist to want to play a character that's part of a group that's like 
going to cause raised eyebrows at the very least. Yeah. Every time you go to a new place, going to have to prove himself every time you go to a new place. I mean, I think I think there is a sort of a market, for want of a better term, for those sort of outsider characters. I mean, sort of mm. back in the day, it always used to be um, so always someone wanted to play a half orc or a half ogre or something like that. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it was always the good drow. Yeah, that, that's a <laughs> that that's a thing as well. Thankfully, yeah. not quite as much now. <laughs> but um, as more and more people were like, "Oh, we want to play half orcs." Half orcs have just become like a normal race now. There's no like real shock value to them. So, apart from their background, which is a bit dodgy, but that's another that's another episode. But um, I think if you wanted to play that outsider type now, but you feel like half orcs aren't really cut at it, you could use mongrel folk mm. or mutoids for that. But as you say, you've got to bear in mind if you play one, you get some useful abilities. But the cost is. You're going to be getting jip in the tavern. People aren't going to want to serve you in shops. People, you're going to have to like disguise yourself when you go to like a city or stuff like that. Or people will be going to giving you the old stink eye. So, if that's something you want to play, and you're going to find fulfilling, that could be a really interesting character. But you've got to sort of take the rough with the smooth when you're playing these sort of outsider mm-hmm. races. Very much. So. That's it for our episode on Mongrel Man. We hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with us to talk about this or any other episodes, maybe you just want to have a chat, then you can drop us a voicemail message using SpeakPipe. Now, some people have said that they've had trouble using SpeakPipe, so if you're one of those people, then you can also drop us a voicemail message on our old Anchor account. I'll put the links to both SpeakPipe and Anchor below. Or, if you want, you can attach a sound file to an email and send it to us at rddrpg at gmail.com. And whatever format you send it to us in, whether it's text, whether it's a sound file, we'll probably find a way to use it. Also, since we've started uploading the podcast to YouTube, feel free to leave us comments on YouTube. We'll see them there. Yeah, currently as of the time of recording, we've got six episodes from the first series uploaded, so last year's. I'm currently converting them, and I'm just about up to date with all the ones I've converted and saved on my computer, and I'm going to be steadily uploading them over the next few weeks. So as episodes go up, feel free to comment on those, and we'll do our best to respond. So thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed that episode. Take care of yourselves, and whatever you're playing, have fun. Bye.